tonight, and especially tonight for this beautiful service and the ordinances that we are about to partake of. I'm so excited to be here tonight. It's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a while, and these are always just beautiful, beautiful services, and we thank God for that, and we thank God for what Christ has done for us. If you would stand, we'll open up the service. Uh, grab your big books, if you would, please. We're going to sing page 62, page 62. When I survey the wondrous cross, page 62. Here we go. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain. Knowing not 
Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Good evening. I have looked forward to this for quite a while. And I pray uh, you'll receive a great blessing for having been here and partaking in the ordinance service tonight. Um, I, uh, just a quick reminder, the youth group is still accepting bags of candy. Keep that on your agenda. And don't forget about the Easter play Friday night at 7 p.m. Please, invite as many as you can, bring as many as you can, and let's fill this place and just see what the Lord has for us. Like I said, sometimes people come out for a play whenever they don't want to hear preaching. So, you know, use it to your advantage. Get your friends and family out, and let's just see what God has in store for us. And the Easter egg hunt will be on Saturday, March the 30th. And then our the part two of the Easter play will be on Sunday morning again. Invite friends and loved ones to come out and be with that. Um, I texted with Sister Helen uh, today. She was supposed to have gotten released today, and that just more than my mind can take in after what she's been through. But God's good. So she's looking forward to being released tomorrow. She told me she plans on being here Sunday in her new Easter dress and her shoes. She said, I'll have to be in a wheelchair, but I am going to be there. And I just pray the Lord does that for her. So keep yeah. praying for her. And, and many of you asked me about Brother Bob. He, um, he's doing well. He's very weak. Um, he uh, is coming along. His faith is intact. His spirits are good. He's just very weak. Everything exhausts him right now. But uh, he's doing well and happy in the Savior. And uh, we want to continue to remember Sheena Jenkins, Kaylin Brown's mother. We want to continue to hold her up in prayer. We want to continue to pray for Sister Marlene Bennett and Sister Yvonne Haskins, Sister Charlotte Kelly um, with her eyes, and Carmen Robinson. We want to remember her. We want to continue to pray for Linda Fox. I've not heard any update on her. But um, I understand that she's home, but she needs our prayers. And I want to continue to remember Brother Steve Knighton. I know he would be here. I know he would be here if he was able. And he's got some issues going on. He's facing some tests. And I'd just love to see the Lord just lift him and, and get him back in church. So continue to remember him. And, and don't forget the names on our prayer list. I, um, you know, get a copy, look it up on Facebook, and let's just keep calling those names out to God until we get results. Amen? God's able, but he's got to know that we need him. He's got to know that we uh, need his help, that we're a needy people. So, and, and continue to remember our pastor search. Um, here again, God knows all about that, and he will provide. I have every confidence, every confidence that the Lord knows what he's doing even when we don't. <laughs> so if you would, let's bow our head 
and we'll look to the Lord in prayer. Yes, Jeff. Remember uh, Sister Colopy? Sister Colopy, I was thinking about Sister Debbie, yes. Yeah, what, what was it? She had surgery. Her shoulder. Her shoulder. Yes, yeah, she had Sister Colopy, Deborah Colopy had surgery on her shoulder. We want to remember her. I know she's on the extended list, but let's continue to remember her in prayer. Um, is there any other um, urgent request that maybe is not on either of our lists? I'm sorry? Sister Carol. Sister Carol. She is on our extended list. Let's remember Sister Carol. She uh, needs prayer. She's uh, very low from what I understand. Just wants to go home. And we just remember her in prayer that God would be near and dear to her. Um, any others? Unsaved loved ones. Yes, our unsaved loved ones. We all got them. And every time I'm at church, I thought, Lord, if they think about me, and they remember where I'm at, speak to their heart. <laughs> Just poke them a little and help them to see they ought to be here with me. But uh, I uh, remember our unsaved loved ones. It's easy to overlook that with all the sick ones, but I do. I want the Lord to fill this house. And George and I was talking today. Um, they're out in the highways and hedges, you know? And uh, we just... God help us that we would be a light, that this church would send the light. God help us. It's a big responsibility. And God find us to be faithful. Amen. Okay, if you would, we'll go bow your heads. We'll look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's just with excitement and a full heart, dear God, to be in this service, this communion service, this ordinance service, dear God, tonight. Lord, we've prayed and prayed and prayed about it. And we're looking to you, dear God, to fill this place with your presence and your spirit, dear God. Father, I just pray, Lord, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, into this place. And we pray, dear God, that our worship will be real, dear God, that what we have to present to you tonight, dear God, would be a sweet-smelling savor, dear God, that it would reach your throne. And, Lord, in return, that you would fill this place with your presence, God, and your power and your glory, dear God. Father, we want to follow you in these ordinances, Lord. We want to hold them sacred and precious, Father. And we just pray, Lord, that this will be such a meaningful night, dear God, for us, Lord, as we remember, Lord, what you did at Calvary. Father, our hearts are overwhelmed, Lord, when we think of it. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. And the grace that brought it down to man, as the song says, Lord, we owe you so much. And we're so thankful for your love and your mercy and your goodness and your kindness and your provision, dear God. That with those stripes, Lord, you received on that day is for our healing, Lord. And we just do bring these precious ones to you, dear God, and asking you, Lord, to walk into these sick rooms, Lord. Every name that's on our prayer list, Lord. And, and there's burdens, God, sometimes we don't know anything about. But, Lord, you're the great physician, dear God. You're our healer. You're our deliverer, dear God. You're our provider. We pray, God, that you'll move in each need, dear God, that's presented in this house tonight, dear God. We ask, Lord, you'll bless this time of worship, this time of fellowship. We pray that you'll make it sweet, you'll make it real, and bind our hearts together, dear God, as we remember, dear God, as we go back in our mind and we remember, Lord, this night, dear God, that you broke bread, dear God, and you shared the cup, dear God, and that you put these things in place, dear God, for us, Lord. We just pray you bless this night. We give it to you, dear Lord. We ask these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask Brother Troy at this time to come and uh, bless his heart. He's had these thoughts on hold for three years. <laughs> and he's going to share with us um, a devotion, some thoughts on the foot washing part of our service. Thank you. Actually, as soon as she said that... Uh, you know, I, I did change things up a little bit because I didn't want to go too long. So we've got the rest of the service to do as well. But I do realize that every time that we gather uh, together, you know, maybe this is uh, your uh, 40th or 50th uh, time going through the ordinance service in the Church of God. 
But we have to understand there's many that are among us tonight that may never have been through an ordinance service uh, at the Church of God. Uh, perhaps there are those uh, that were recently just saved and this is their first ordinance service that they've ever been to. So I want you to bear with me for just a few minutes uh, as I kind of go over the uh, purpose of the ordinance service. Um, and also, uh, before I even get started with that, we'll kind of go over uh, a, just a brief order of the service. Um, so uh, I'm going to give essentially the foot washing part of the uh, ordinance service, speak on foot washing, and then when I'm done, we will be uh, dismissed back to the fellowship hall. Uh, we will break off. Men and women will go to different parts of the fellowship hall. Women will go to the new side of the fellowship hall, and then the men will go to the old side of the fellowship hall. Um, after the foot washing service uh, is completed back there, you know, please quickly wash your hands, come back into the sanctuary, and when we are seated, I believe we just want to use these two uh, parts of the church and sit every other row because an usher is going to be coming by and serving you the elements. So it's a lot easier for the ushers to get through the aisles if you sit every other uh, row to give them some room. Uh, and then uh, Sister Donna will give us a brief message on the Lord's Supper and we'll partake of that ordinance. And then I told Justin he's got to have a hymn ready because the scripture says that they sang a hymn and they went out into the night. So we will sing a hymn and go out into the night. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, I just wanted to cover the ordinances, especially for those that this may be your first ordinance service. Um, and I, you're probably noticing that things are a little bit different than other uh, services that you have uh, been in. Um, so what is... An ordinance. So an ordinance uh, is, is something, uh, many religions, of course, have uh, rituals that they perform. Uh, if you look back at, uh, you know, even in the Bible, uh, there were those uh, who served false religions that performed different rituals, generally asking for something of their God or trying to appease their God. However, Judaism and Christianity are a little bit unique in that we have very few of these rituals that have been given. And when we uh, celebrate these, you could say, rituals or ordinances, we are always looking back at a completed work of the living God. Uh, for something to be considered an ordinance, there's three things that are uh, considered necessary for that. Uh, the first is it has to be something that was commanded by uh, Christ for his followers to do. Number two, it has to be something that is to be universally observed by the church in all ages. And then number three it is an action that uh, has a symbolic character to it. In other words, these are what some would term an object lesson or a visual sermon as some would say. If you think back to the Old Testament, there were uh, several uh, ordinances that were observed in the Old Testament, and we, when we look at the three that we observe today, you will find that there are connections even back into the Old Testament. Albeit that Jesus Christ changed just about each and every one and, and gave them a renewed meaning in Christ. So the Church of God recognizes uh, three ordinances as meeting that definition that I just said. The first is believer's baptism by full immersion. The second is the Lord's Supper or communion, which we'll celebrate tonight. And the third is uh, foot washing. When it comes to the ordinances, there's a couple caveats to remember here. Um, Throughout all of the uh, millennia of Christianity, um, most Christians have agreed on what constitutes the ordinances, but there's always been sharp disagreement as to the meaning of those symbols and whether or not they contain any mystical powers to them. For instance, the Roman Catholic Church teaches 
that the elements in the Lord's Supper become the literal body and the blood of Christ in the mass ritual, and that this is truly propitiatory. So when the Roman Catholics take the elements, the uh, bread and the uh, wine that's used, they believe that their sins are actually forgiven by that taking of the bread and wine. Uh, there's others that teach that baptism itself likewise saves from sin when you're baptized. So the Church of God, as well as many other Protestant churches, do not hold to that view. You know, we do not believe that the ordinances are necessary to atone for our sins, as that was done by the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So atone for our, to atone for our sins requires us to admit that we are sinners and unable to save ourselves, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for our sins, and then turn from our sins in repentance and confessing our faith in Jesus Christ alone. So we do not, although we celebrate the ordinances, we do not believe that they contain any mystical powers to save you uh, from sin. So this is why you'll often hear the Church of God and many other Protestant churches refer to these rites as ordinances and not sacraments. Really, the two words are very similar. They can almost be used interchangeably, but we don't want those who have come out of Roman Catholicism or have a non-Christian background to get uh, what we are celebrating confused with what the Roman Catholic Church and others are are celebrating in, in their ordinances or sacraments. Um, however, we 100% do believe that all born-again Christians should partake in the ordinances as instituted by Jesus Christ. As Scripture indicates, there's a blessing involved in remembering what God has done for us in Christ, and this remembrance will draw us closer to God and strengthen our walk with Him. So regardless of our belief on those mystical powers of the ordinances, we still do hold this time as a solemn and a serious ceremony. The Church of God does practice what's called open communion, which means that while this uh, ceremony is meant truly for born-again Christians, we want you to partake as your conscience permits, and we're not policing the process. Some churches practice closed communion where they will only commune uh, card-carrying members of that church. We do not practice that. Uh, we must recall, though, that the Lord's Supper and foot washing were both instituted by Jesus Christ as he spent his last hours with the disciples and was in much anguish, and we're going to read about that here soon. We must also remember that during his ministry, Jesus reminded us that the two greatest commandments were to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. A multitude of Scripture indicates that a persistent and unrepentant failure to do either of these is not consistent with the Christian walk. These two ordinances, thankfully, give us the opportunity to consider whether we are walking in this truth and call us to keep our faith and to walk in Jesus Christ. As Paul indicates in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when we come to these ordinances, this is a solemn time. We are to examine ourselves, he says, as we're partaking of the, uh, the bread and the cup. And he says, and then to eat and drink of the cup to avoid being guilty concerning the body and the blood of Christ. So we are to take these uh, ordinances as a time to reflect and when you look at John Wesley and others, they recommended that these ordinances be carried out often uh, because uh, they wanted their church to have time to reflect. So now talking about foot washing. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to uh, John chapter 13. And this is where we find Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Now if you were to read... The story of the Last Supper, that's where we're at here in John chapter 13. Uh, you would notice that uh, in Luke chapter 22, the disciples enter the supper 
with a similar argument that they've had all along in Jesus' ministry. And that argument is about who is going to be the greatest. Not necessarily Jesus, but is Peter going to be uh, greater than, let's say, Thomas or someone else? Or is John going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? In the book of John, the first 12 chapters concerns Jesus' ministry to the rest of the world. And the last chapters here, 13 through 17, are covering his ministry to his disciples. We must realize that Jesus spent those last hours, uh, that la even the last uh, week of his life, really ministering to and preparing his disciples. So if we are born-again Christians, this pertains a lot to us. So keep in mind here the disciples are arguing over who is going to be the greatest. And starting out, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then he poured water into a basin, it began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed need not wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that is why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and he resumed his place and he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And then uh, for a few more verses... Uh, it speaks of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is dismissed out into the night, and he will betray Jesus. And then we'll pick up here on uh, verse 31 through 35. In my Bible, it has a heading there. It says, A New Commandment. So it says, When he had gone out, so that's when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I have said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, so by that love, all people 
will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So, we see that this new commandment was given, as we just read. A new commandment for a new group of people. Not the Judases of the world who would betray Jesus Christ, but a new commandment for those who would follow Christ and who would become his church. And what were they to be known by? But love towards one another. And what type of love is this towards one another? It's a humble love that would stoop down to wash his brother's feet. That is, to do anything that will improve your brother, make his life cleaner, more dignified and comfortable, bring him closer to God, perhaps. The love that is within our church is expected to excel that which the world shows, or that we even show to the world. And I'll say that again, the love that's in our church is to excel that which we see in the world and even that which we show the rest of the world. You know, I think of this as a big family. And big family, sometimes it's hard to <laughs> get along with everybody. But in the end, you, you love those people. And you'll, you'll go to bat for those people. You'll take care of those people. And this is what Jesus is telling his disciples. They're to have a love for one another. As we know the rest of the story, it's going to get very difficult for the church. They were going to need that love. And that's what they, they would be known by. That's what would draw people even into the church. Of the three ordinances that we've mentioned so far, foot washing really probably is the most controversial. Although one should note that opponents generally do not see it as you know, anything heretical or repugnant to Scripture, just maybe a little bit gross and unnecessary when you read their arguments. You know, it's an interesting viewpoint, you know, because in a way I believe that it kind of mirrors Peter's reaction to having Christ wash his feet. You know, he did not, he felt that this was such a menial task, and it was. This was something that only the lowest of the slaves would be required to do. There was laws actually in uh in the then known world, where if you, were, if you were a student of a teacher, the one thing you didn't have to do was wash their feet. And this is the background that this is being done in. These people probably knew that that was the law of the land. You did not have to wash your teacher's feet. But here we see the teacher, we see the master stooping down to wash his disciples' feet. But let us not miss the lesson here. You know, Peter, he probably would not have minded if Christ had asked him to wash his feet and if this ceremony was pointing to us to adore and to venerate Christ as our Lord, which we should do. But that is not what Christ taught the disciples, nor is that what, that's what he told him, them to do. Instead, Christ demonstrated incredible humility towards his brethren by this act. Then he told them not to wash his feet, but to wash each other's feet, something that all of them had failed to do while they were too busy arguing over who was the greatest. So wherever you fall on your beliefs on foot washing as an ordinance. I was uh, telling Brother Zolaz, as I was studying this, I didn't realize this, but not even all of the Church of God pioneers uh, believed that foot washing was an ordinance. Um, A.L. Byers actually wrote a, a book stating his beliefs why he didn't think it was an ordinance, but all of them agreed that they weren't going to tear the church up over it. <laughs> and that's what I think is, is so beautiful. So what, wherever you fall on your beliefs on foot washing as an ordinance, I really like how uh, A.F. Gray in uh, his uh, Christian theology summed up everything. And he says this, 
He said, among the defenders of foot washing as an ordinance are to be found many who are not only holy men, but who are also good thinkers. These men believe sincerely that they have found the truth on the subject. They will admit that there are objections that are difficult to answer, which is true of many doctrines. But they believe that the preponderance of evidence favors their view. In view of the fact that there are wise and holy men who differ radically on the subject, it seems necessary to avoid a dogmatic attitude that would tend to break fellowship with Christian brethren over a ceremony. To observe the ceremony without the spirit of humility, which it so clearly teaches, is to make of it but an empty form. To oppose and to ridicule those who do observe it is clear evidence that its lesson has not been learned. So he said, really, (laughs) either way you look at it, if you're ridiculing those who do it, you haven't learned the lesson. If you're doing it without a spirit of humility and you're ridiculing others, then you obviously haven't learned the lesson either. But he says, let all who participate in it so humble a servant or in participate in so humble of a service do so sincerely and in the spirit in which Christ washed the feet of his disciples. So with that, we're going to be dismissed back to the uh, fellowship hall. Again, uh, women are going to go to the new fellowship hall, that side of it. Men are going to go to the uh, old side of the fellowship hall.
Are we ready? <laughs> All of our people are in place. <laughs> if I can have your attention once more, we'll go ahead and get into the communion part of our service tonight. Uh, Brother Troy did a wonderful job. He um, said some of the things that I was going to cover, and that's quite all right. Um, you can't hardly talk about foot washing without putting communion with it. They, they're hand in glove. So uh, if you would, if you want to follow along in your Bible, turn to Luke 22. Um, I thought about this scripture and uh, just anticipating this service. I could understand when Jesus said, with desire, with desire. He is so anxious and excited and looking forward to having this last meal with his disciples. Knowing what he was getting ready to face, he was, he was excited and he's wanting to, longing to sit down with his disciples and, you know, break bread and, and drink the cup and, and to teach something new. Jesus came to fulfill the law. And upon his death, he brought in a whole new way to come to God, to worship God. He did away with the old. To, and, and, you know, I think it was um, Paul, maybe it was Peter. He said he brought in a better hope. You know, because the blood of bulls, it's not enough. It's not enough. You know, whenever they were doing the Passover feast, it was always a reminder that, you know what, you're still unclean. But there's coming a day, there's coming a day. It was always looking forward, looking forward, you know, always looking for the Messiah. But he come in, and with this, with this communion supper, with this last supper, he brought in that better hope. And, you know, and, and he said to do it, to do it, and to remember and this is, I, I, you know, I've told my children, to me, this communion service is one of our high holy days. It is. It's a time when we can all participate. You know, Easter Sunday is great, but if you really want to partake of Christ's suffering and what he meant and what he implemented, there's no more beautiful time to do that than this ordinance service. And I pray that you've already, I thought as we were all gathering in, and I thought of his words, and Troy already said it, now are you clean? <laughs> and now we're going to take of the communion. Just a, a few little thoughts. But if you would look at Luke 22, he says, verse 15, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom. Another um, passage of scripture will come to that. And I may just read these to you without turning there. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. We still have a ways to go. But the Lord's Supper is a soul-stirring experience because of the depth and meaning that it contains. Jesus instituted a significant new fellowship meal that we observe to this day. It's an integral part of Christian worship. It causes us to remember our Lord's death and resurrection and to look for his glorious return in the future. Jesus at supper took a loaf of bread and gave thanks to God. As he broke it and gave it to his disciples, he said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And Paul, he, uh, it's not included in the gospel accounts, but Paul said, For whenever ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This places a time limit on the ceremony. We are to do this until Christ's return. Jesus used two, and I thought this was a beautiful thought. Jesus used two of the frailest elements as symbols of his body and his blood. Um, you know, he could have used a big old monument of stone. He could have used costly, um, a costly, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I thought someone was helping me out. He could have, you know, something of molded brass or something covered in gold. But he used two of the most common elements, bread and wine. And I was thinking, just walking from the dining hall to here, that bread, even beggars could have it. Even the poorest had access to bread and to break that bread and to remember Christ's broken body for us. He didn't get something that would be tough for us to obtain. He made the most common, most available things to whosoever will in that time and for us as well. We don't have to travel far off and look at some monument to remind us of Christ's body being broken. We don't have to import the most precious of wine. You know, it's His Spirit that makes the difference. It's His Spirit here tonight that makes a difference whenever we partake of the bread and when we drink of the cup. And, it, and like I said, it, it's just beautiful that it's accessible for everyone he declared that the bread spoke of his body that would be broken and the wine spoke of his blood. And when he said, do this in remember, remembrance of me, he indicated this was a ceremony that must be continued in the future. The Lord's Supper, Christian communion, is a remembrance of what Christ did for us and a celebration of what we receive as a result of this sacrifice. If you turn over into Corinthians, I want to read this real quickly. Brother Troy touched on it quickly. Um, Paul says in verse 24 of chapter 11, he said, when he had given thanks, he break it, speaking of the bread, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. We've already mentioned, do this remembrance of me. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body." So, you know, I read that just to help you to see it's a serious time and it's a sobering time. And whenever you, um, and I do it every time, I just sit there and just meditate on what the bread is and what that little bit of juice that you're going to have here in a minute. I, you just think of a body so broken for you, for you. And... I, I love the ordinance service. I love it that we do it on the Wednesday night because it just sets the stage for Good Friday and for Easter. It's a wonderful time to just take the rest of the week and just think about what Christ did at Calvary, what he did on the cross, what he instituted. It's for your joy. It's for your peace. It's for forgiveness for you. It's so that you can have a relationship with the Father. He loved you that much that He would lay down His life for you. And let's think of that as we begin the communion service. I've asked Sister Kathy Strickler if she would come and pray over the bread. And Brother George, he's going to pray over the cup if you want to come and take a seat. I just want to tell you, a lot of you, and I don't mean to embarrass Sister Kathy, but for as long, 30-some years, that I've been in this church, she has, with her mother and for a lot of years by herself, has prepared the bread that we're about to break. I think it was in 22. She was too sick to do it. And we had crackers that year. That's the best I could do. <laughs> but she called me last year after getting over surgeries, being so sick. She called me, and she, she knew she couldn't be here. And as much as she knew, that would be the last time she would break bread, bake bread for this service. But God's merciful. 
I've asked her to do it because she's had a hand in it for years and years, and it means something for her to her. It's not just I've got the recipe and I, you know, this is just what I do. I know it holds great significance for her, and as it should for us. And I'm just so thankful. This year, she's well able to do it. She's well able to help with the food washing service. God's brought her a long way, and we're thankful. And uh, Sister Kathy, I forgot I hooked up. <laughs> you all bear with me. I'm new at this. <laughs> If you would come and pray over the bread. I want to say something. I want to say something before um, I pray over this. My mother, when she got older, she turned this over to Dawn and I. It meant a lot to mom. And mom said, I don't want somebody, and not that I think of anybody. It's going to sound like I do, but she wanted it turned over to somebody that would take it seriously. And I know she groomed Don and I to do it and how to do it. And um, I was thinking of my mother when I was baking the bread yesterday. I loved my mom dearly. And um, she's gone now. But as I was baking this bread, I just thought of her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know the first time she said, and it does. It, you, I don't know who, ever, who has ever baked communion bread. It looks nasty. And I know the first time I was going to do it, she says, I want you to come to the house because you're going to think you did something wrong because it does. It's, it's interesting looking. <laughs> but I just am so thankful for the heritage yes. that we have. And this does. It means a lot to me. I love my brothers and sisters. And um, this is very unrehearsed because I didn't, Donna didn't tell me <laughs> just a few minutes ago that she wanted me to do this. But uh, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, as we come before you tonight, we're so very, very thankful. God, we, we can't even begin to thank you or to appreciate even what you've done for us, God, because you've done so much. Yes. And Lord, as we think of this bread, Lord, and when you told the disciples, Lord, to do this in remembrance, Lord, and it included us, each one of us that would follow. And Lord, we so appreciate, Lord, your broken body, Lord, what you went through, God, so that we could have salvation, so that we could have heaven, Lord. We just appreciate what you went through, your suffering, your love, God, unto us. And Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, as we partake of this bread tonight to remember, Lord, to remember what you've done, to appreciate what you've done, Lord, and to love one another as we ought. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Brother George, you would come. Don't know if you just want to. Okay. Father, what an honor and a privilege be able to partake something that our Lord did so long ago. He passed a cup to those he loved, his disciples, and told them what it was to be about, his death. And then later on that night, there was another cup, a cup that he drank of, his suffering yes. and his pain for our salvation. Yes. Tonight, is the third cup. It's our cup. Our cup to be able to participate in his death, his process for our salvation, and for us to remember all that's been done. Father, we ask you a blessing upon these cups. Yes, God. And each individual that partakes, let us remember. Let us think. Let us pick up that cross that he carried and carry it forward. Strength, ambition, courage. Do all this, we give you the thanks and the praise. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you, Brother George. Um, well, if our servers would come at this time.
people to Bethany or in the nursery.
Go with it. 